1230. Hello, can you hear me? Perfect. All right, we're going to have a AI and cryptocurrency talk. Um, being Working in AI myself, I'm super excited for this talk. We have today Imad, um, who you may all know from Stability AI, um, and we're going to hear about his ideas about decentralization and how we can move forward in that regard. Um, perfect. And I want to welcome to the stage Manish, who has directed last year's expo and is helping me direct this year's expo. We wouldn't be able to do this without them. So can we get a round of applause for Imad and Manish? Hey, Imad. Welcome back. Hey, Mish, how's it going? I'm glad that to be you know, a lot's uh, been going on with you, huh? So I have it, we were, for people that don't know, Imad and I were together at the AIML Summit just last month, and uh, it's official. You are in the matrix. Your life is moving as fast as AI. You, uh, <laughs> yeah. So you stepped down as CEO uh, from a company you built and scaled into a global leader in open source AI models. Pretty huge decision. Uh, tell us about that and why it was time to move on. Yeah, so um, thanks for having me again. And, and it, it does move fast, AI, probably faster than Web3 and the <laughs> two together move even faster. Uh, two and a half years ago, we set up Stability AI and originally it was meant to be a DAO DAOs because we had all these communities that were building amazing models. Um, first of all, GPT, J, Neo X, and then Stable Diffusion and others. And in those two and a half years, we had 300 million downloads by developers and built the best models of every class except for very large language. So image to 3D to medical. But then I think as AI is progressing, it's become clear that the shortage maybe isn't GPUs, it's governance, it's coordination and it's distribution. Because you see it becoming more and more about just a few companies that can do this and they don't really have any oversight and who's participating in decisions that affect our lives as this technology proliferates is something that's just a few people. So looking at that, um, I basically think now's the time to really move aggressively to decentralize AI effectively. And I think bringing together AI and Web3 is the best way to do that um, with coordination mechanisms, distribution and governance as well. And I think it's an ideal time to do that because we've only got a window of a few years to get this right. Awesome. Well, welcome to Web3. You uh, Tell us a little bit about how you first got started in AI. Yes, yeah, so I've been in actually Web3 since like 2011. Um, my kind of course mate at uh, Oxford was one of the co-founders of BitMEX, and I've lost more crypto over the years than I can deign to imagine because I'm very bad with private keys. Um, so like I said, originally stability was meant to be a DAO of DAOs, but then I realized there was no real intelligence in Web3 or DAOs, and it was direct democracy. And we'd have to build the AI that could lead to better coordination mechanisms first, which I think we now have. We now have AIs that can judge resolutions and help people make more informed decisions. And I think that opens up a new type of organization. But this is something I've always been interested in, like my speciality previously was mechanism design and epistemology and other things. And I think, again, the kind of shelling points that we see in AI and uh, Web3 are going to be very interesting with the coordination side going forward. So can you tell us a little bit about your background in Web3? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was basically, like I said, um, about 13 years working with various protocols and then uh, 2017 advising a bunch of them um, and Stability itself wanted to be a Web3 kind of DAO DAOs, but then it went to become a Delaware media company. Um, I think that uh, also recently I joined the board of Brenda Network uh, to distribute data creation and data set creation and helping advise on the token economics there. Uh, plus we had a dedicated Web3 team at Stability that's now coming over as uh, part of the new venture to help try and coordinate all this together. So last year, I led a panel here at this conference um, exploring with some really smart crypto OGs, you know. Um, we were exploring this intersection of AI and crypto. And at that time, we were experiencing this mass exodus of crypto devs or engineers into the AI space. But we didn't have many AI devs 
um, exploring you know, decentralization using Web3 principles. And so I'm glad I finally get to ask this question of someone with your background. How can Web3 help AI? So I think that when you look at what AI is, it's the algorithms, it's the data, and it's the supercompute, right? And you mix them together and ask the recipe to create a Llama 3 or a stable diffusion or something else. I think what Llama 3 and stable diffusion others have shown is that actually the data maybe is the most important bit because uh, we currently feed our models junk. And what goes into that data has massive impacts as to what happens downstream because you have these imputed variables and biases that are baked into the model. In fact, you can even poison models. So there was something um, anthropic, one of the leading AI companies had a paper called Sleeper Agents about how you can put data into models that allow them to turn evil with a phrase. So you say Dosvidanya and then it turns evil and it can't be trained or tuned out. So there's a data verification component that's gonna be essential. There's a kind of data governance thing, who feeds the data and who decides on the data that runs your government, that teaches your kids, the medical side. There's an output verification thing. Can you tell if that's a human or an AI? Again, you kind of look at like Emo by Alibaba or some of the new voice technology, you can't tell it from a human. And then there's the coordination aspect of this whereby, you know, we've kind of done lots of experiments in Web3 around that. How do you coordinate the decisions made around this AI, but then also the distribution and integration of this? Because once you go from the base models to flows of models working together to agents, the agents aren't going to have bank accounts to pay each other when they're working on your behalf. It's going to be crypto. And like I said, there needs to also be the proof of personhood between crypto AI agents and then human agents as well, because now the cost of creation has gone down to zero. So there's this massive overlap between the two. I think, again, the last year, moving on, um, from when the technology wasn't quite good enough, but now it is, people can really see where that overlap is, and they need to start incorporating Web3 elements into AI. And Web3 also needs to incorporate AI into it to improve and fix many of the issues that we've seen over the last decade or so. Very cool. Very cool. I, I want to come back and hit on some of those points later on in our talk, but I'm going to ask you the reverse question. Um, how can AI help Web3? So I think that, you know, you can consider something like Bitcoin a slow, dumb AI, maybe a bit better than many organizations and then it provisions people and nodes, et cetera. And, you know, again, the organizations that we have within Web3 as well as conventional aren't good enough because they lack this distributed intelligence aspect. So DAOs are all usually about direct democracy and then there's a misalignment of incentives because you can't check things against DAO constitution. We have that capability now. We look at smart contracts and how many hacks and other things do we see because we don't have code reliability or audits. We now have AI models that can take in a million lines of code and just bang at them constantly to figure out any gaps and then any improvements there. This also can reduce for smart contracts and I think what comes after, which is intelligent contracts, the ability for people to engineer them because there's been this massive like barrier of you have to learn solidity and you have to learn a lot of system design and other things to actually build useful primitives on kind of Web3. So that's why I think bringing AI to Web3 can help us make better decisions, can help onboard people quicker, can help us build better systems to intelligently act self-sovereign for us and achieve more of our potential. And then also kind of track what's real, what's not real, what's AI and what's not AI. So I think that there is a move right now of bringing AI to Web3 and then Web3 principles to AI. And I think they're quite symbiotic. And I think they're both needed. Yeah, it seems like one sort of came right after the other for a reason. You know, uh, it's the it's interesting. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, I think uh, ironically, like it was the GPU boom, right, from Web three, that then led to the AI boom. Like they put the tensor chips in all of the GPUs that we use for Bitcoin mining, that then became available for the AI mining. Interesting. Yeah, I, I like the idea of like intelligent contracts. I'd like to maybe talk a little bit more about that if you have some time. But uh, so now that you're moving into decentralized AI, what does decentralization mean to you and how do you implement it in this AI space? So I think decentralization to me means like we have this concept of the self-sovereign individual that everyone kind of in this whole kind of heard of, but 
we now have these AIs that can be, they're like graduates that are very talented, right? And they can draw and code and dance and sing. And we've found this new continent, AI Atlantis, where there's a billion of them. But who's educating them? Who's putting the defaults in there? It's just a few people in Palo Alto, right? I think that there needs to be an alternative to that. And so those are open models that represent you, your culture, your decisions, and that you fully own. So we have open models now like Llama 3, but we don't have open source where the code, the data, and others are interrogable. We don't have governance mechanisms for deciding on the data that goes into the models and having these as public goods. Every nation should have this as infrastructure, both from a generalized model perspective, community models, but also healthcare, science, education, et cetera, because we'll have breakthroughs there. So the decentralization is about decentralizing, act, distributing access to this, so democratization, so it's available to everyone in a way that reflects them and works for them, and that the governance of what goes into them is transparent and people can participate in that. And that's kind of what I viewed by this decentralization. And that creates an alternative to the popular narrative, which is these gigantic AGI models that do everything. Like, what I'm more hopeful of is a swarm of models that represent each of us, that contribute to a global commons, that allow us to have collective intelligence to achieve most of these problems rather than, again, this kind of God AGI concept. But the coordination of that and how that comes together and the protocols for it to occur are not easy. You know, this is like a real distributive systems challenge. Um, but I think it will be a far stronger thing than this giant model trained on all the crap of the internet. Models that represent us that would fall privacy and coming together to solve problems on an individual to a societal level. Hmm. Yeah, giant models, that kind of leads me into my next question. So AI is notorious for needing a lot of data, compute, storage, et cetera. And the general perception, I guess, is that bigger models are better. And centralized systems have an advantage when you talk about their ability to coordinate their resources. Uh, how do you compete and overcome that um, you know, using, using a decentralized approach? So we created communities, I think Discord communities combined had 500,000 people on them, developers, and we built the best 3D model, image model, audio model, kind of edge code model, edge language model out there um, by being highly efficient and working with the constraints, whereas many of the other companies basically took big crap data and applied compute to make up for the bad data and bad algorithms. Like you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So something like a Llama 3 performance, you know, you can probably get that on 10 to 100 times less compute, but there's a question of, does a big model outperform a mixture of experts model where you take lots of small models and ensemble and swarm them? With Mistral and Mixtral and others, we've seen maybe that isn't the case, and Myshell and others have kind of had models similar to that. What does, this is a duck-sized human, human-sized duck or 100 human-sized ducks, you know, kind of question. So I think that you have to look at it from a different perspective, uh, but you just need one entity to build good quality open models, just like you need to have a Bitcoin foundation or an Ethereum foundation kind of creating the base, because then you can take advantage of the swarm of intelligence like SETI at home to do mass tuning of models that represent every single culture and country, because 95% of the stuff is in the pre-training stage where that last 5% of data represents Albania or Algeria or cancer or multiple sclerosis. And so I think that's where you need to again think of as is curriculum. And we're seeing more and more that it's about data efficiency and the quality of the data versus the model themselves. So the base architectures can always be replaced. And the compute speed and power is becoming exponential. Like by the end of next year, to train a Llama 270D model or a stable diffusion will probably cost like $1,000 to $10,000 because of the massive speed ups that we see in compute while the incremental gains from creating multi-million chip supercomputers will start to tail off because otherwise we get into this artificial super intelligence kind of area where the data needs to somehow create something better than the data, which I think is going to be difficult. But if it does, then we should again have an alternative, which is a decentralized alternative to build an open competing ASI, which is a whole other kind of worms. One thing I've got to know about you is that you kind of take on big, big ideas. And, uh, you know, 
but I'm sure you start with like at least a, a starting scope, right? Like any good project needs to have like a, a scope that is maybe in line with what you can do to start off with. So I'm thinking if I asked you today in a perfect scenario with the brightest AI and Web3 minds working on your team, what do you first task them with out of these three choices? Decentralized training and transparent data sets, decentralized inference, or governance? I think the decentralized fine tuning and data sets is the most important one right now because that can proliferate to create 100 national models and models for every type of science if you do that correctly. So it's not necessarily decentralized training from scratch because you can do a lot of the pre training, like sending someone to a liberal arts degree or a computer science degree that then gets tuned on the job. But the data quality of that is going to be the biggest determinant. And by having good quality open data sets, you also make the world safer because then people don't need to rely on scrapes anymore because you have quality and diversity for that. Inference, we can now do inference of GPT-4 level models effectively with Llama 7TB on a MacBook, you know. Uh, it is a MacBook Pro Max, but again, the market will adapt to that. And on the governance side, nobody really knows how to handle the governance, but you've got to build the models for every nation and for cancer and MS and others first that you can then iterate on with the governance. Like I think it comes after you actually build the data sets and models that represent each of us and an open infrastructure for the data of that. So I want to get into each one of those a little bit. So decentralized training, you said say that would be the first scope that you would chase. Uh, so I, I would say decentralized tuning. I think it's still far more efficient to do the pre-training aspect with a gigantic supercomputer. Mm, I see. So in the case of decentralized tuning, how do you pay people for their GPUs or compute? I mean, I think this is again where you can have token economics. Like, do you want to contribute to a data set that represents a mark? you know, or Venezuela. Yeah, I think people would want to do that. And they'd give feedback to a model to do that, as well as artificially augmented data sets and more. You know, like let's map out all the parts of science, et cetera, you know? And let's have verification tools and others. This is again where token economics becomes very useful. And you can do models at scale distributed because now we can fine tune like 7B models on consumer graphics cards. And that becomes again, something very important because you have the base model training, which is like putting them through high school, then you've got the uh, supervised fine tuning bit, which is putting them through university, and then you've got the reinforcement learning with human or AI feedback, which is the on the job training. And again, those last two bits are probably the most powerful in uplist of this for specific areas. Um, and there's a whole bunch of incentivization mechanisms, as I said, that we can do for that, both from a bottom up basis and also a top down basis, because every country wants their own models. And we all deserve to have for example, healthcare models that give us comprehensive authoritative and up-to-date knowledge on everything from Alzheimer's to autism to cancer, so that no one's alone on that journey anymore, and then eventually it can lead to research and other breakthroughs, because now we can build a GPT-4 level model at that level. So now moving on to the data sets, is do you continue to use Web3 principles, like maybe you know improve on current KYC practices to ensure better data sets? Is that is is that another part of what what we've had happen in Web3 that you could take advantage of? Yeah, I think that you will have a mixture of generalized human data, like uh, commons, as it were. And again, there's a lot of work that have been done around commons and how do we fund them and how do we organize them here. And this should be available to everyone, again, uh, in a decentralized way. And the specific, what about your data and the model interacting with your data in a way that you own it or you can contribute it to a whole? You know, this is where you have ZKML, you have all these kind of other concepts in there so that you can have a self-learning system that adapts from education to healthcare to government and more while preserving the privacy and sovereignty of each individual. And this has a concept of kind of face layering where you've got knowledge that moves very slowly and knowledge that moves very fast, generalized knowledge and specific knowledge as well. And how do we build that stack so that we have an effective operating system of knowledge for humanity where anyone can get the information they need to prosper and we can also solve some of these bigger group societal problems by having a shelling point, an organization point, a core source of truth for all of this. So moving on to inference, is decentralized inference as important now that we are thinking about you know, compute on the edge? Um, is that necessary for a decentralized AI project? 
I don't really think so. I think that the bottlenecks will probably unlock over the next year or so. But again, like I said, you can run a 7B Llama 3 model or one of our stable LM models runs on like anything, a CPU, but a Llama 7B will run on a MacBook Air as fast as you can read, right? And it's high quality now, like it matches the previous top models of the last generation. It's still full of junk. So I think you'll have useful models that satisfy working on the edge already. Um, the larger models will require far more than consumer GPUs, so you can't really have that. And you have this bifurcation between small, very capable models on your smartwatch, phone, laptop, and then these real expert models. So your generalized graduates and then your experts that you call from the cloud. And so I think that we need to think more about distributed fine tuning, training, adaptation, as opposed to necessarily there's not enough inference compute to go around. So um, <clears throat> as we've seen with Bitcoin on-chain transactions versus Visa, which is something we've talked about in Web3 for years, how do you compete with a centralized system when it comes to inference? How do you compete with a centralized system in terms of response time and user experience without compromising on security? So I think this is where kind of the cross verification checking and other things of the knowledge side on the fine tuning and data sets becomes important. I think decentralized is actually better than centralized, can get quality and diversity of feedback, plus you can temper it and harden it. On the inference side, it is very difficult to compete um, because again, like where is the advantage of that unless there is a chip shortage? And I think again, that's why I'm not as bullish on the inference versus the decentralized data set creation optimization of models and more, where I think, again, that benefits from decentralization, uh, plus the quality of the data that's output there, just like the quality of a ledger. Um, I want to move on to governance. Um, so governance is interesting to me, because a lot of the things, you know, um, with Web3, it's been hard for us to figure out governance. Um, and unlike cryptography, the governance portion of a lot of projects, they just don't depend on the math that the protocol is based on. Do you have some novel ideas on how AI can help solve some of these governance issues that we've been finding? Yeah, I think that you know, you've know you got the creation aspect where you can tell it to go and write a poem about a shark dancing with a hippo or the moon or something like that. <laughs> but then you have the ability of these models to check and cross-check against constitutional norms and others, because we have this wealth now of data from DAOs and others about what works, what doesn't work from democracy and others, what works and what doesn't work. And effectively, what we need to do is co-pilots to help us make decisions on an individual and group basis. And that can be the foundation of governance, because governance is, are we acting according to principles that we ourselves have articulated? And it gets lost because there's too much information coming, usually, or there's misaligned incentives and no independent third party from a mechanism design perspective to cross-check that. But now with GPT-4 level AIs, we have the ability to cross-check any decision that we make, as well as have more informed decision-making because we can deconstruct things down. And we have the context window extensions and others where you can literally load every single thing that you've ever done at the MIT kind of Bitcoin club and make decisions versus your history on that at inference time. So I think that you will see a next generation of DAOs that are actually intelligent um, will they be completely autonomous? Maybe, you know, or at least they'll be augmented, right? And they will make better decisions, which I think is a very powerful type of organization, particularly as it comes at the same time as the Wyoming Duna laws and others, whereby our organizations can maybe move from being slow, dumb AI to more advanced AI <laughs> um, that don't kind of chew us up. And then, you know, as you look within Web3, a large part of this is that we played status games with token economics to bootstrap economic incentives before we delivered value because we had identity and value transfer, but we lacked intelligence. Whereas most of Web2, the most and biggest companies in Web2 were like Google and Meta, which are AI companies, ByteDance, et cetera, right? That could route things via AI because Web3 didn't have the capability to push intelligence to the edge and it had no centralized AI capabilities. So I think we can now make more intelligent decisions around value transfer, around logic, again, going from smart contracts to more intelligent contracts that are more flexible, yet act within constitutions, and then collaborate and come together to make better decisions that are cross-checked and referenced by a reliable third party. When you try to marry a system like 
crypto systems being deterministic and AI systems being non-deterministic, when you're trying to marry these two things together, it's hard to find this point where they actually meet, but governance seems like a place that can just be vastly improved maybe. Um, do, you, do you agree? Even though- I mean, AI systems don't need to necessarily be non-deterministic. Like stable diffusion is relatively deterministic and the same seed and the same hyperparameters lead to the same outputs. And this is something that we built into the Comfy UI system that you can take an image and it'll deconstruct every hyperparameter that led to that. So you can share all those decisions. Similarly, language models, if you do them straight out, have a large amount of temperature variance. So the output's not always the same, but you can actually make it the same. But I do think you've got something correct there where you said this interaction between deterministic, relatively non-deterministic and deterministic systems. There's a wealth of stuff that can be done around there because you can use the determinism as an anchor but then again, have flexibility of agents and augmented humans within that ecosystem that allow it to iterate and drive forward much faster and have a much wider degree of capability. So it's less brittle because determinism can cause systems to become somewhat brittle at times. You know, we could talk all day and I didn't quite get through my list, but I want to open up to audience questions at this time because I'm sure people might be interested in uh, getting some, getting their own questions answered. So if you have any questions, please come to the microphones in either aisle and fire away. Okay, I'm gonna continue with my questions then. Um, so you said in the past, um, you don't wanna launch a token and don't really prefer to create a new L1. Are there projects you can see yourself working with on this venture that exists today? Yeah, so like I, said, I joined the board of Render Token because I saw it as a bridge for the creative industry and I'm helping them kind of upgrade and create open data sets and things like that for 3D. So it could be the foundation of a holodeck and talking to a lot of the others in the space. And maybe there will be a token we'll be launching in the new company kind of soon. Um, but it's just, I think a lot of entities like do the token economics before the value creation and it kind of locks them in. So I just want to be very intelligent about kind of how I approach this and focus on the key deliverables. What I want to build in the next year is I want to build GPT-4 level models for every type of disease. So you have comprehensive authorities and up-to-date knowledge there and have a governance system for that. And I want to help every single country have its own capability to build national models that are owned by the people and governed by the people of those countries and data sets that reflect their culture and then those combined are much better data to feed into any type of AI model that will make them safer. And what brings that together from the identity side to the verification side to others, you know, there's people and amazing teams working on each of these areas of the stack. And so I want to bring AI to help them do even better or I'll have to build it myself, which I prefer not to do because building L1s and building verification and self-sovereign identity is not an easy task. But I think it's something that we have to do, um, either accelerating existing teams or building it kind of de novo because everyone deserves this technology because it can make us better and help us achieve our potential. You said in a talk with Peter Diamandis recently that you're doing this now because you have a two year, you're, you expect you have two years to do this. Can you tell us, can you expand on that a little bit of why that timeline? So I think that every single, <laughs> model that drives governments, education, and healthcare need to be open and transparent because the data can be poisoned otherwise, and that will not stand. Um, and governments and institutions and others are very open to having a state-of-the-art kind of organization come and build models that they themselves own. And I think you can impute a lot of norms in there that reflect self-sovereignty, kind of classical Web3 ideals, and more during that period but by next year all the large organizations and countries and others will have a strategy and then it becomes very ossified it will likely be one that's very centralized and controlled and gives up a large amount of our sovereignty because that's how they minimize for regret so i think that there is a window here where we can build a movement and build these models that are owned by the people for the people and spread this out with good standards that can be a protocol for the future or an AI operating system for each of us that helps us, our kids, our parents, and more, with AIs that we own that work for us. And again, I think that'll be an ecosystem and probably the missing part of Web3. So I'm very kind of positive and bullish on that. 
because I know that we can build GPT 3.5 heating models for any nation, and we can build GPT 4 level models for any type of disease, and that will make a real impact, and then we can go from there. No, I appreciate you very much for taking this on. I think it's a big, it's a big project, and it seems like you have some great ideas. And you're always pushing the edge and a champion of inclusion, whether it's providing open models and weights with stability, and now trying to help us decentralize AI away from these new superpowers that seem to be forming. Um, you know, I wanna just thank you for your time today, and we appreciate you and wish you success in this new venture. Ladies and gentlemen, Imad Mostik. Thank you.